Oh, good morning. morning. Oh, come on now. That was kind of weak. <laughs> I tell you, if you've not been to church right now, you know, I don't even feel like I need to get up here and preach. If you've not been to church right now, you know, I like what Brother Ronnie said, your wood is wet. <laughs> Let's try this again. Good morning. Good morning. There you go. There you go. This morning, I'm going to talk in uh, Luke. I'm going to be in Luke chapter uh, 22, verses 39 through 46. Luke 22, verses 39 through 46. You know, it's not that often that sometimes... Um, we have something that feels like it's been really spoken to us. I, I, I'm not going to lie. I'm not joking around when I say that I feel like I don't even need to get up here and preach. We've already been to church because God has been speaking to me this morning, and I don't know if he's been speaking to you, but through the music that we have just heard, through the time of worship that we have just spent, spending some time with God, I tell you, I, I've already been blessed. Amen. And being blessed, though, I hope that this message is a blessing for you. You know, while you're turning in your Bibles, um, here, I think we were, I was sitting right here. Um, I don't know if many of y'all remember back in, uh, uh, around Easter time frame, you know, Brother Ronnie, when we're talking about Jesus, and we're talking about Jesus' death, resurrection, and his preparation to be able to go through that, Brother Ronnie showed a video, and the video that he showed was a little girl singing Gethsemane. And I was sitting right there, you know, where us good Baptists always sit in the same seat every time, you know, <laughs> beside Laura. I'm sitting right there, and I felt like I was being spoken to. And in being spoken to, I was overwhelmed with so much emotion, you know, as Laura would say, you know, I was leaking. You know, <laughs> Laura will tell you, when she comes over, uh, when she feels like she's being blessed, uh, when God is really speaking to her, she comes over, uh, the emotion that she has, it just, it just makes her feel like she's leaking. And I felt like I was leaking. And you know what? I couldn't control it. I couldn't control it to the point that I think Laura leaned over to me and she said, hey, is everything all right? And I'm like, yeah, everything's fine, babe. But, you know, whenever you feel like you're being spoken to, a lot of times it could be, be through something that you've read. It could be through something that you've uh, seen. It could be something that you have... Uh, either been uh, or heard through teaching, preaching, or singing. You know, I was, like I said, I was so overwhelmed with emotion that I couldn't hold it in. And then a few weeks later, and my bride there, she'll be the first one to attest to you. And Brother Ronnie, it's not that I'm not listening to your preaching or anything. I felt like God was speaking to me. And in speaking to me a few weeks after we saw that video, usually what happens is, is I turn around and uh, I've got like a little, I usually keep little note cards or sheets of paper in my, uh, in my books. I, I take notes on what Brother Ronnie was saying, but in the midst of taking some of the notes, I was given this message. It was called The Game Changer. Um, and it was I, was, I was told that I needed to go to this passage and I needed to read this passage. So let's go ahead and read the passage here in Luke 22, verses 39 through 46. And if you'll please stand as we, uh, as we read this passage. Luke 22, verses 39. Coming out, he went into the Mount of Olives, and he was as he was accustomed. And his disciples also followed him. When he came to this place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone throws away, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is, not, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he rose up from prayer, he had come to his disciples. He found them sleeping from sorrow. Then he said to them, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray, 
lest you enter into temptation. Let us pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to thank you for today. We want to thank you for this time of worship that we've been able to come into uh, and enter into with you, Lord, uh, through song. Lord, I just want to thank you for each and every one of us that are here today, Lord. And Lord, I just want to right now just ask that I decrease and you increase, Lord. Lord, just give me the words, have me high behind the cross, that you would have me spoken, have me spoken to uh, everyone here today, Lord. And Lord, we just want to thank you. We want to thank you. We want to thank you, Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So as I'm sitting there, and, and, and I already gave you the title, I really felt like there was this small voice that was telling me the game changer. And I'm sitting there, and I, I, so I write that down. I go, the game changer. At this time, I was so overwhelmed that I, feel, I felt like I could not hold it in. And so I'm sitting there, I write the game changer, I write a couple of notes down, and in writing these notes down, I'm just going to tell you real quick that this is what I felt like God was leading me to talk about. It says here, God provides a helper. God provides truth. And God provides His promise. You know, Mike uh, Mabry knows this week has been a very challenging week at work, and we have been very busy and all that. And... Um, and doing what we were doing and all that, I even talked to Brother Ronnie about this earlier, I felt like Satan was attacking me this week. As I'm trying to prepare for this message, I already had these notes on my heart. I already had a message title. I had the three points here. I'm like, I'm golden. I'm gravy. Here we go. We're going to get this going. It's going to be easy just to be able to pull my thoughts together and talking to God and figuring out what it is that he has laid on my heart to talk about here today. And sure enough, every time it seemed like when I was at my desk in the office or anything like that, I'd sit down, I'd start getting ready to read the passage, I'd start getting ready to write down some notes. I was going to take these notes and transfer them over to the computer. It always seemed like, here it was. Hey, sir, I need to talk to you about something. Hey, we need you to go to this meeting. Hey, sir, can you handle this? Or this, or this plethora of emails would come in. And then getting these plethora of emails is almost like somebody needed a response back. And I said, all right, I've got to do this. I've, I, I've got to do this. I've got to get this finished and all that. And so I think it was Thursday morning. I got down on my knees in my office. Luckily, the door was shut. Luckily, I knew a lot of people wouldn't be around. We were in that transition time where people are going home or they're going to the showers to get cleaned up and get ready. And I just opened up my heart to God and said, God, what is it? that you would have me to speak about concerning this subject that we're going to speak about. And he gave me three simple words. I really felt, I mean, I was, I, was, I was on my knees crying because he gave me these words. He said, grace, faith, and love. And that totally took what I felt like my message, and you know, the, the message that I had already thought that I had heard that he had told me in the opposite direction. And that's what I wanted to share with you today. Because when it got to the message itself, I mean, there's a couple of people in here that can attest to you. I said, man, I feel so overwhelmed. I'm going to ask them this question. Hey, when you look in the Bible or when you read God's word and God's truth, what is the game changer in the Bible to you? Some people will come back and say, it was Jesus' birth. Other people would come back and say, it was Jesus going to the cross. Other people would also say it was Jesus going to the cross, his death, his resurrection. And all of those are the game changer in the Bible for the Christian today. They are. But the thing is, is the thing is, is I was given an opportunity to share something that was given to me just simply listening and obeying what God was telling me sitting here in church. And I felt like I had to share it. And I was like, man, I know, I, I know God, you're going to give me the opportunity to be able to, to, to speak here. Um, if you put me and you and Brother Ronnie on the same sheet of music, 
Whenever I'm given this, other, this opportunity, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going, this is what I'm going to talk about. And that's what God had led me to believe. And, of course, a couple of weeks ago, Brother Ronnie had asked me, he said, hey, do you mind covering down for me on the 12th? Uh, uh, I'll be back, but, you know, I'm going to be on vacation. And I don't want to take away from my family time, uh, spending time with them, preparing a message for this Sunday. And so this is the message that I was given. The first point I want to bring up is that Jesus knew that God's grace was sufficient. Jesus knew that God's grace was sufficient. Jesus was God in human form. He walked among all of us during that time. He was still human, but he was God in, human's form, in, in human form. And he knew that God's grace was sufficient. Sufficient. Second Corinthians twelve nineteen says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I were I will rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Second Corinthians nine eight says, And God is able to make grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, that you may have an abundance for every good deed. Paul is talking to the church of Corinth at the time. This is something that God had laid on Paul's heart to share with the church of Corinth during this time that he's, um, he's saying this. And Paul... Do, uh, putting this uh, in Paul in his writings to the church of Corinth, these are the words of God being spoken through Paul to the church of Corinth. He is saying here that my grace is sufficient for you. He is also saying that in, in 2 Corinthians 9 8, he is saying, so that always, always having all sufficiency in everything. Jesus knew this. He did. He knew what was going to be written. He knew what was going to be discussed between Paul and between the church of Corinth. These are God's words. And because Jesus knew this, he knew that no matter what he was getting ready to face here, as you know, you know, he's in the garden, he's praying, or he's getting ready to prepare for praying. He's trying to get his disciples to prepare for praying for the road that is about to come ahead of him. And in doing that, he knew that God's um, grace was sufficient. So what did he do? In verses 40 and 41 here, it is kind of talking about uh, the instructions that he is getting ready to, that he's given to his uh, disciples. It's also talking about what he is getting ready to do, meaning Jesus. So Jesus made himself available. The reason why he made it, the reason why he knew that God's grace was sufficient is because he made himself available. He went to the garden to pray. He knew that he was about what he was about to face was going to be a struggle. It was only a matter of moments before they were coming to arrest Jesus. He made himself available just because, like you and I know, and we have heard from Brother Ronnie before. And, and I, I will tell you, Brother Ronnie has said this before, and, and, and it really touched me when Brother Ronnie said this, but he said, God is looking for the availability, and he will give us the ability. Jesus knew what he was about to face. He made himself available. God gave him the strength and the ability to be able to do what he was about to do by getting ready to go on the cross and die for our sins. Amen. He did. So he made himself available. He also knew that there was only one God. Amen. And that is true for you and I today. Brother Ronnie has been preaching on idols. Idols are things that are not of God. Can I get an amen? amen. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus knew, and you can read it throughout the Bible, there are many incidences where other people are serving other little g gods. 
But Jesus knew that there was only one God. Matthew eleven twenty seven 27 says, All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except for the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except for the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Again, knowing the road ahead of him, he went to have a conversation with his father. He was preparing himself. He made himself, um, he made himself available. He knew there was only one God, and he was preparing himself. No one can get you to heaven other than the personal decision that you make in your life to follow Jesus. Amen? It has to be a personal decision. It cannot be anything that Matt Hash stands up here on, behind the pulpit and says, Hey, if you do not go, if you do not come down here, if you do not accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you do not go in that baptism and be baptized by water and all that and try to scare you and say, You are going to hell. Me saying something like that is not going to get you to heaven. It has to be an open heart. It has to be an open mind that you have in a personal decision that you make yourself. Amen. And if you don't make this personal decision, I tell you, you are going to split hell wide open. Amen. You are. And I'm not up here to preach on hell, fire, brimstone, and all that. That is the only point I'm going to make on hell. But the thing is, is it has to be a personal decision. Jesus prepared himself because he was making a personal decision to go and have a conversation with his father. Preparation is one of the most important things that you can do. And Jesus knew this. How many of y'all spend time on your knees before any, ma uh, any major decisions that you make? And I'm not asking you all to raise your hands on this. But how many of you all spend time on your knees concerning anything, having a conversation with your father, your heavenly father, about a decision that you're going to make? That is one of the most important things that we can do. Preparation is prayer and seeking God's will for our decision. And we'll talk about this a little bit more in a few minutes. Jesus knew he had to prepare himself for what was about to come. Just as Jesus had to prepare himself, we have to prepare ourselves. That small little voice that was talking to me about the title of the message or, the title, or the, the, the title of the message that I've given to you today was a still the same small voice that felt, I felt a few minutes later talking to me, telling me, I will give you strength for what is coming ahead. And I could hear it plainly. Being in the military, Laura and I have had a lot of conversations about this. Being in the military, you know, there's a time where your military service is going to end. I'm not going to lie. My time is getting ready to end. <laughs> I knew I'd get a hallelujah. Yeah. Randy's back there. He's about to start dancing, you know, because uh, my time is about to end. I know that this small voice was telling me for what you are about to, the road that you're about to go on, I am preparing. I, I am, I'm strengthening you to prepare you for what it is that you're about to go through. When you spend time in prayer with God, he will strengthen you for the decisions that you will make, no matter what it is, no matter how small it is, no matter how large it is. He will strengthen you. And like I said, we'll talk about this in a few minutes. So, not only do you have to, or did Jesus know that God's grace was sufficient enough, Jesus also knew he had to step out on faith. Jesus trusted his father. When it comes to trust sometimes, how often do you doubt the motives of those asking uh, us to trust them or we think that our way could be better? Again, I'm not asking you to raise your hands. But the thing is, is, you know, when somebody looks at you and says, trust me, I got this. How many of us actually turn around and follow up behind that person and make sure that that thing is being done? Um, you know, if you have kids, the kids go, Dad, trust me, I took care of the chickens. Yeah, I'm throwing chickens out there. You know, Laura's a big fan of chickens. I took care of the chickens and put them up. There are some times where Laura and I go, hey, 
Did they put up the chickens? I don't know. Did they put them up? What happens is, is we turn around and sometimes we walk outside to make sure that the chickens are put up in our backyard. And it's not the fact that we think that our son is trying to deceive us. And yes, I said son, Jacob. <laughs> We don't think our son's trying to deceive us or anything like that. The thing is, is it's just, it's, it's just you want to do that follow-up and stuff. But when Jesus knew that he did not have to do that follow-up, if you look in verses 45 and 46 here, it says, When he rose up from prayer and he had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Then he said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. If we, in reading those verses, it's been put in there twice that Jesus said that to the disciples as they were getting ready to pray. So Jesus, yes, he had to follow up on his disciples because his disciples were men. He trusted his disciples that they were going to spend time in prayer in the same amount of time that he was spending in prayer having a conversation with his, or with his father. He knew that he was going to spend that time in prayer, but when he walked out, he saw his disciples were asleep. They were, they were sitting there. They were, they, were, they were laying there. They were asleep on the ground. And he had to do that follow-up on them. But the thing is, is you know what? Jesus, Jesus never... Never had to, uh, to uh, think that he needed to follow up on his father and that his father was going to finish the promises that he said that he was going to do. Never. Never had to do that. And the reason why he never had to do that is because he trusted his father. Secondly, he obeyed his father. Hash kids. <laughs> Not pointing you out, but sometimes how hard is it for you to obey us? I'll ask the rest of us. How hard is it for us to obey those who ask us to do something or those that we work for or those that we love that is our spouses? You know, if they ask us something, we need to be obedient. God tells us in the Bible that obedience is a key and fundamental thing of following him. Amen. And, to, and that obedience has to be there. And Jesus had that obedience. I like to, uh, it was something that kind of came to me uh, today, and yes, I'm going to use a little bit of this military uh, uh, lingo here, um, because multiple times over this week, uh, when I was in meetings or something like that, it always seemed like things were coming down the pipes, and everybody was asking, hey, were you tasked or were you asked? In the military, if you're tasked, you're going to write an order, that tasking is going to go out, and then those people that are tasked are going to be the ones that are going to have to finish up the thing. But a lot of times, it, it, depends on, it depends on who you know, what organization they live in, and whether you need to get something done. You may make a phone call and go, hey, I really need your help on this. Okay, are you sending down a tasking order? A lot of times the people will go, nope, I'm just asking. And when they're asking... The thing is, is you have to take a look at whether you can, whether you can move things around, do things, or have things uh, in place to be able to get that asker done. You know what? This book right here and everything that's in this book, God tasked us. He didn't ask us. And because he tasked us and he didn't ask us, we need to follow his instructions in this book. To follow his instructions, we have to be obedient. And to be obedient means that you have to trust in Him. You have to trust in your Heavenly Father. And that's what Jesus was doing. Because in those two verses right there, verses 45 and 46, He had got up from praying. He told His disciples, He said, Hey, you need to pray so you are not led into temptation. But the thing is, is right when you start in verse 47 here, Next thing you know, he's speaking to his disciples. That's when the crowds are coming. That is when he is getting ready to go and do the trials that he's about to do so he can go on the cross and, and, and take on our sins. We know that. And because we, because we know that, because we read it in this book, he was trusting his father. He was obeying his father when he got up. Because, like I said, Jesus was God in human form. There are many times where we will sit there and we'll go, I don't know if I need to do this today. I don't know if I want to do this today. 
I don't know if, uh, hey God, are you leading me this way? Yes, I am leading you this way. But uh, I, don't, uh, I don't know. I'm about to retire. Where's the money going to come from? Is one of the things I'll be the first to tell you. That's one of the things that goes through my head right now. Where's the money going to come from? God is going to provide. If I trust in him, if I obey him, he is going to provide. Amen. Jeremiah 7, 23 says, But this is what I command them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you will be my people, and you will walk in the way which I command you, that it may be well with you. Those are instructions from God that he, is telling, that, uh, that he is telling Israel. Because we know if we've spent any time in the Bible, there was a season of obedience with Israel. There was a season of disobedience with Israel. There was a season of oppression. Once that oppression had too much toil on Israel, that's when they turned back to God because they were worshiping other gods. And Nehemiah was clearly saying here, that obey my voice and I will be your God. And that is what God, that's what God was telling Jesus here, is he was telling Jesus, obey me. So not only did he trust his father, not only did he obey his father, but he also believed his father's promises. If you read the Bible, everything that God said he was going to do, he did. It's in, this, it's in this book. It's in this cover. It's from cover to cover. As, as Brother Ronnie likes to say, it's from the index to the, uh, to the back, you know, the maps is what he likes to use in the Bible. It's in there. If you read this Bible, everything that God said he was going to do, he did. Jesus, for the three years of his ministry, had been teaching that he would be crucified on the cross, that he would... He would uh, he would die and he would be rose again. It's even in the scriptures before. There were prophecies in the scriptures before in the Old Testament that says this is going to happen. Everything that was said about Jesus that was going to happen did happen. Everything that is written in the Old Testament was written by God. And because it was written by God, God kept his promises. Jesus was born. Jesus ministered. Jesus, <coughs> Jesus was persecuted. When you look at Isaiah 53, 7, it says, He was oppressed and, he was, and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like the lamb to the slaughter, and as sheep before the shears is silent. So he did not open his mouth. The last part of that scripture is talking about, and if you read in the Bible, when Jesus was with Pilate, when you read in the Bible, Jesus was with Pilate, he did not open his mouth. When everybody was saying, crucify him, crucify him, he was standing there. God, Jesus being God in human form, could have called upon his heavenly father and could have just wiped out everybody who was there. But did he do that? No. His mission, as I dropped the mic here, I should have picked it up and dropped it. <laughs> his mission, he knew what he was supposed to do. And because he knew what he was supposed to do, because he was trusting his father, because he obeyed his father, because he believed his father's promises, is the reason why he went on that cross for us. Because he, trusted his father, because he trusted his father, because he obeyed his father, and because he believed his father's promises, he did the most important thing for you and me. Amen. This most important thing, which is the most important point, which is why I kind of skipped around when you look at these verses here of Jesus' um, Jesus' prayer in the garden. <coughs> Excuse me. Of Jesus' prayer in the garden is because these are the most important verses uh, here in this, in, this, uh, in this scripture. Jesus showed his love for us. Verses 41 through 44. I want to read this again before I get into 
the last couple of points that I have, and we close out the service today. Verses 40, uh, 41 through 44. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw away. And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And key in on this verse right here, verse 43. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. I said I want you to key into this verse here in verse 43. Out of all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Luke is the only Gospel that says that Jesus, or that God provided an angel to appear to him from heaven, strengthening him. This is the only verse out of all four Gospels where it says that an angel appeared to Jesus as he was in the garden praying and strengthened him. I'll get into that here just in a second, but the thing is, is, you know, Jesus, the reason why he went to the garden is because he knew the will of God. Verse 42, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Knowing the will of his Father for him, his life, knowing the will of, the father, knowing the will of his Father for him in his life is what gave him strength. And that strength was the angel that God provided to allow him to pray. Because can you only imagine him being there and he's praying. And in praying, he knows what's ahead of him. He knows the cross is ahead of him. Because he knows that the cross is ahead of him, he knows that death is inevitable. Because of death is inevitable, he knows that he's going to rise again. But the thing is, is when you look in the scriptures, there's a lot that went on before Jesus even made it to the cross. He was spit upon. He was mocked at. He was accused, falsely accused. And not one single time did he stand there and say, why are you falsely accusing me? I did not do this. Not one single time. And I'm just, it's not in the Bible, but I mean, he, he didn't say this. I didn't see, I, I mean, if I read the Bible, you know, it's not in there that says that he said these things at all. The strength that God gave him as he was playing was a helper. And I put it as a, you know, that was the angel that came to him to give him strength. You know, to me, and, and like I said, when I, first started, when I first started speaking this morning, I said, I could not contain this. And because I could not contain what I felt like God was speaking and putting on my heart, I talked to some people. Laura heard me talk. Mike Mabry heard me talk because I asked him the question. There's a couple other people at work. Uh, I asked them the question and stuff. It gave me an opportunity to speak uh, to people about this. The reason why the message, the title of this message today is called The Game Changer is because this right here to me was the beginning of a game-changing event. Knowing the road ahead of God, or knowing the road ahead uh, that Jesus was about to go down, praying for each one of us, he knew that he was going to take on the sins of the world. And in knowing that he was going to take on the sins of the world when he was on the cross, <coughs> he was having to, he was, he was in agony. It even says in the verse here, in verse 44, it says, and being in agony. He was in agony because when you look at verse 42 here, it says, or it says, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. He's asking his father, if it is his will, take this cup away from me. Because I know each and every one of you have gone through trials, gone through tribulation, gone through heartache, gone through multiple other things. And because you have gone through these things, 
You know, there have been times where you, you just want to ask God, please take this cup away from me. That's what Jesus was asking right here. But he said, he said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He said it. Not my will, but yours be done. So he knew the will of God. <clears throat> he also showed the love of God. And my closing point here. He showed the love of God. I talked about it just a few minutes ago, but he was praying so earnestly and when you say earnestly, hard. He was praying earnestly because he loved us. He was in agony. And his sweat, and you still reference this in verse 44, his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. He was in agony. He was on his knees. He was on his face before his father. God, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. But not your will, or not my will, but your will be done. He knew he was going to take on the sins that we were going to have to do, the sins of the world. And he was praying, he was in agony, he was hurting. <clears throat> and being in agony, God provided an angel to strengthen him. And because God provided an angel to strengthen him, that was the game changer. That was the game changer for me. His death, or his, uh, his, uh, his crucifixion, his death, his resurrection is overall the game changer. I know I like... Uh, I like Mike Mabry's uh, analogy of Easter. He calls that the Super Bowl. Amen. <laughs> I knew I'd get an amen out of him. He calls uh, Jesus' resurrection from the grave the Super Bowl event and all that. Many of y'all have seen it many times. I, I don't watch as many sports as I used to. Uh, um, every once in a while, I'll flip through the channels and I'll watch the sports. There are many examples in sports history where... You know, you got the starting quarterback of a team. You've got the starting player on a baseball team and something like that who, who gets injured. And when they get injured and all that, they're taken out of the game. And when they're taken out of the game and stuff like that, everybody's like, oh, no, our season is lost. Oh, no, we're not going to win. Oh, no, we're not going to make it to the Super Bowl and stuff like that. And, you know, the thing is, is every once in a while, there are these – these, as I call them, a game changer, a helper, that come into the game. Uh, one person that comes to mind, and, and he is of strong Christian background, is Kurt Warner. Kurt Warner came in partway through the season, won some games for St. Louis. St. Louis was able to go to the Super Bowl, and I think St. Louis won the Super Bowl that year for any of you NFL football fans. But the thing is, is um, that was a game changer for St. Louis. I'm not trying to compare any of the texts in the Bible that we're, uh, we've been reading. I'm not trying to compare Jesus' death and resurrection to a football game. I'm just trying to use that as an example because many of you all know, because we, we, just like me, I know you all, have you all have TV, watch games and stuff like that every once in a while, and you see things and you see stories and you see examples of this stuff. But that was the game changer. And God showed, meaning Jesus, showed his love, <coughs> excuse me, showed his love for us by staying in Gethsemane, spending time in prayer with his father, praying to his father. And this prayer was not just a one-way conversation. A lot of times, us as Christians today, when we're going through stuff, we like to pray. And when we pray, it's like, Father, help us with this. Father, I need your help with that. Father, please continue 
uh, continue uh, to pray for so-and-so and stuff like that. But the thing is, is a lot of times, you know, there's a reason why God gave us two ears and one mouth. A lot of times we need to keep our mouth shut. We need to meditate on what it is that somebody may be talking to us. And because we need to meditate on what it is that somebody may be talking to us, we definitely need to stay connected to God and meditate on what He's telling us each and every day of our lives. Amen. And that's what Jesus was doing. And because Jesus was doing that, He was showing His love for us. Because the Bible says that He was arrested. The Bible says that He was beaten. The Bible says that He was spat upon. The Bible says that he went to the cross. The Bible says that he died, but three days later, he came up from the grave. And there is no other religion that I know where, where, they're, where they came out of the grave. It was Jesus. Jesus is the only religion that I know that where, God came, where Jesus came out of the grave. Amen. And because of that, he did that for you. He did that for you. He did that for you. And He did it for me. Amen. And because He did it for us, He showed His ultimate love for us. Because being God in human form, He could have questioned His Father. And He did not. Amen. Our Heavenly Father's desire, <coughs> in closing... Our Heavenly Father's desire is for us, or for us is, to be conformed to the image of His Son. And that's highlighted in Romans 8, 29. And transformed into His likeness, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. Until our character comes into the fullness of Christ. I told you earlier... And I'll tell you again, and I'll continue to tell you, and I'll continue to testify to everybody that I know. This was the game changer. This was the game changer for me in my life. I'm going to ask Brother Ronnie to come forward in closing. And I'm going to ask everybody to go ahead and bow their head and close their eyes right now. We'll wait, on the, uh, we'll wait for a minute on the uh, praise team to come up. And uh, if the praise team will come up while we're praying before we go into this time of invitation. Um, with every head bowed and every eye closed, how many of you, and I'm not asking you to raise your hands, how many of you have experienced the ultimate game changer of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your lives today? Just think on that for a moment. How many of you would say, Brother Ronnie, Brother Matt, Brother Ganish, Brother Rich, any of the deacons? I have experienced the game changer in my life, but I haven't been living it. Acts 3.19 says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. You may just need some time of refreshing. You may need some time of repentance. And you may just want to come to this altar today and get down on your knees and pray. I don't know. Only you know where your heart is this morning. Someone here may say, I have not experienced the game changer in my life but want to know more about God's grace being sufficient. I want to know more about how to step out on faith. And I want to know more about God's love. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's not a prayer that you say. You have to pray to God and ask for God for repentance, but it's not a prayer that you say. It is not you walking or running up the aisle, getting down on your knees. It's not you coming up here asking Brother Ronnie or to baptize you and you being dunked in the, uh, in, in, in the baptistry there. It's none of that. It is your heart, your heart condition, and you opening your heart to Jesus Christ.
to have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior in your life. It's a game changer. It is. The only reason why I can stand up here today and, pro and profess that God is in my life, that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, is because of the game changer that I had in my life a long time ago. The only reason I can get up here today and profess and say that there has been a game changer in my life is because I came to this altar and I prayed, knowing that I was a, knowing that I was a sinner saved by grace, knowing that God loved me, knowing that I knew that Jesus Christ was my Lord and Savior, but knowing that I was not living my life the way that God would have me to live it. That is the only reason why I know what I know, that I know that Jesus Christ is number one. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And maybe today is the day that you want to ask Jesus into your life. Maybe today is the day that you want to have that real game changer in your life and come up to the altar and pray for repentance. Maybe that is that day today. I don't know. But I'm going to go ahead and ask Brother Ronnie to come up here and pray for this time of invitation uh, right now. And uh, then uh, uh, we'll go ahead and have the invitation.